Well, hello, hello. Welcome to this week's episode of Grow or Die. I am Alora Chestikoff from Firebird Summit, and I'm here with my partner. Hey. What's up? What's up? Laura Tenderson again with Boss. Awesome. Well, uh, again, just for the sake of posterity, I guess, it is April yeah. 8th when we're recording this. So we are uh, still in the middle of our lockdown at home, thanks to COVID-19. Yeah, yeah, so how's that going for you? Uh, it's going well for us. Um, I just sent my wife and the dog away. Uh, that's that's how we've been staying sane is we we rotate who who goes on these short runs. Yeah. Um, and I tell you what, we're from a physical standpoint, we're uh, adjusting very well. We've started these twenty one day workout challenges, and I think we're going to come out of this thing. We're determined to come out healthier. Good. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, it's. I think it's figuring out the physical part when you feel so yeah. limited is super, super tough. We're, yeah. we're kind of going back and forth where during the week we're staying at my boyfriend's house because that's where, you know, his job, he can still work. So he has to be close during the week. And then on the weekends, we go to my place um, so that we can get a change of scenery because since I'm working from home, the same four walls are starting to really close in. Yeah. So. Yeah. Got to gotta shake it up a little bit just to keep from completely going crazy. <laughs> oh, anyway, so, well, so uh, for any of our small business owners uh, or independent contractors, freelancers, um, this week is the week to make sure that you are applying for the payroll protection program, which was part of the stimulus package that was that was released. Now, the downside is that all of the big banks pretty much at this point have hit their cap on how much they've been able to lend. So you might have to go looking for a smaller bank uh, because the big banks at this point, until, unless or until the federal government can get them a, um, an exemption on the, on the cap for what they are allowed to lend, uh, they are limiting any further applications to existing clients and customers who had accounts back on February 15th. So I know um, there was a lot of news this week about Wells Fargo. Uh, they have, they, their application wasn't up for very long before they got flooded and had to completely take all applications offline. Um, other big banks like Chase are only accepting applications right now from existing clients who had, who had accounts back in February. Um, so you have to definitely look around a little bit if you are a small business owner who wants to apply for some relief. So take a look, but don't give up. Uh, a lot of the, the cap seems to be universal, regardless of the size of the bank. So your best odds right now appear to find a small regional bank that does SBA loans, that doesn't have so many customers that they've, they've already hit their cap. So keep hunting. There are still, there are still options available, but it's definitely tightening up fast. So don't wait too long. What about you, Lawrence? Anybody that you know who's uh, trying to, trying to, get access to some help? No, so uh, I think for the most part, everybody that I, that's, that I know regionally, they've been, they've already diversified. So, um, and I'll, I'm always concerned about my, my small business veterans, but uh, a couple of my friends that I was, I was deployed with and stationed with that are local to me, they're the consummate uh entrepreneur and they had their hands in like 10 different pots they had a luxury transportation company uh, uh one of those silent party headphone companies like they i mean they they were working it they were working it really well so I, and everybody was kind of like that and i think one of the things i'm super excited about is that um for the, mo the most part everybody had put themselves in a financial position to go a good little while um, without these loans. And I think what a lot of people, uh, even though these loans are available and this, this capital is available, and like you've been saying, banks, they haven't been advertising what those caps are um, and they're reaching them really, really fast. But I think people have to be, and again, using capital, having access to capital is really the biggest thing that, that everybody's really trying to grab at, but also making sure that if this doesn't teach anybody anything is to make sure how are you going to build up your reserves moving yeah. forward? Because again, don't under, I mean, again, if not looking at the interest rates and different things like that, um, of what this payback looks like. Um, and so if you're maxing out what you're asking for, how long until you get back 
to a place where you're paying off these loans quickly um, and those big numbers stop hitting you on top of rent, on top of payroll, on top of all these other things. So just being mindful of that as people uh, begin to get this extra and reach out for extra capital. Well, yeah, and I think that's, you know, that's, I think, the biggest risk, right? Because yep. even even if you, you know, if you have a landlord who gives you relief on your rent for a couple of months, yep. that doesn't mean they're they're dismissing it. In a lot of exactly. cases, they're just giving you a grace period to be able to pay it longer. But if that means that in June, suddenly you have three months worth of rent due, exactly. that's not necessarily going to solve, solve your problem. So we all have to be really careful, I think, about yep. what what we take on and it's it's uh, uncharted territory for a lot of what the yes. SBA is trying to do right now. So definitely, definitely be careful. The other thing that um, my CPA was really clear about was that any loans you take that have to be any SBA loans, make sure they go into a separate bank account so mm -hmm. that you can keep those funds very clearly tracked so that nothing, nothing gets mixed up or muddled and you have an absolutely crisp audit trail for exactly how that those funds were spent. Um, you know, a lot of the SBA loans are, are, um, do have some payback relief if you use them for things like payroll, which is great, but you have to make sure that you have that that tracked extremely, extremely clearly. Um, so yes, make sure that you put it in a separate account. So that's that I think that's that's kind of the the baseline for where we're at. That sets the stage for our exactly. current our current set of circumstances I this uh, this uh, week in April. Okay, yep. so coaching mystery box time. And yes. it is my turn to pick a topic right. for Lawrence. Let's do it. Okay, so I would love this week to talk about the eternal coaching exercise of reframing. <laughs> um, it's to me, reframing is is actually one of it, it's probably the most useful tool in yeah. the toolbox for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. But what I like about reframing is that I think there are a lot of us who had mm -hmm. extra, had an experience of having circumstances reframe something for us. Yeah. at different points in our lives. Um, so what I would love to hear from you, Lawrence, is about yeah. a time that you had, that the universe reframed something for you where yeah. you just felt like you got hit over the head. And then a time where you actively chose to reframe and you went to the effort to try to yeah. reframe something for yourself. Oh, man. So, so I say um, the world reframed for me um, in the universe, uh, it was probably 2016. It was uh, my first job um, outside of the army and I was doing HR information systems work and very agitated, very angry. And this is before I had already had, you know, started down the path of coaching modalities and, and, and learning different things. And I was really in a really negative place. And it was normally I was the person that called people out on their stuff when they weren't the hand the right, right mind frame and different things like that. And I had a co coworker that I wasn't uh, overly fond of, um, that uh, she was the consummate pessimist. But this one particular day, I was, I was pitching a fit about something, something really simple. And she goes, why don't you do one of those things you're always trying to get me to do? And I'm like, man. And in the moment, I wanted to throat chopper. Like, <laughs> I, like, I really, like I really wanted to flicker in the earlobe. Like, but everything in me, and it was like, again, the seed was there. It was already growing, but I was letting something else rule. And it immediately, I reframed. And that moment actually catapulted me into going down the lanes of training and development, um, building values and character training and all the rest is like, it literally catapulted me when I reframed my thought around this situation. And the one time that, and, and I do reframing all the time now, um, particularly as it pertains to this situation we're all in, and particularly around when I walked away from my job and that conscious decision, um, because again, my wife is the what if queen and she's what if, what if, what if, and this is all before I handed in my resignation. And I said, babe, I said, 
what if it works out so incredibly well that it renders your what ifs irrelevant? And it was, and, and for me, it provided her energy in that I took what she was saying and she was, she admitted that she was coming from a very negative not even cautious place. It was from a very negative, I don't see it, I don't feel it, it's not gonna work. But the reframe of, man, well, if this works out well, we'll be paid three times, four times what you were ever making annually when this work. And, and what I did, the reframe was when this works out, not what if this works out, when this works out. And it was an intentional part on my, it's not only for her, but it was for me as well mm -hmm. to not, because what if is a dangerous thing, right? You could what if yourself to death. It's, it's, it's like, it depends. What if is like, is it depends in language. And what, 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 it, what if is the question part? It depends yep. on the answer part. They're both exactly. these very non-committal, fuzzy, exactly. worst case scenario yeah. conversations. And, and, the when, and when this happens, put me on the hook for yeah. some action and i and i and i kept and i wrote that in my journal i wrote that in my planner i wrote that everywhere when this happens when this happens and i think that was a powerful tool for me um early on as in my full-time entrepreneurship journey okay so how do you use it with clients like what, oh, so, so when you, when you go to somebody that, you know, isn't, you're not married to yeah. and that, that you have, you know, a little bit more distance sure. from, let's talk to me about how, how you've seen clients either use it or struggle with it. Yeah. Um, just, just had an appointment yesterday, um, where the client was, uh, was, it was in a framework of collaboration and it's just a simple, how else could you could that be perceived? How else could you see that situation? And it, it's the, and it's the, just the offering, right? And it's, and may I offer you something like, and it's, and then again, it's so subtle in how you do it in that it creates, it helps them begin to create a new reality in that reframing environment. And I think that is important for a client because they're going to feel how they're going to feel. They're gonna already bringing their own level of energy to a session. And I think when you stay at a certain level in that session and, and you hold that space and protect your energy, because I'm a true believer in when you start working hard as a coach, basically you've lost the session. It's not as it, like a coach should not work hard when you are in a, and it, the client is the one coming to do the work. The coach is not doing work for them. And I was holding the space for her and I was a, I was a five. I was, I was holding my five and, and she was really like, she was at two and it was like, I was like, what's another way to see it? And she sat and she was like, well, one, I didn't present any other opportunities for me to see it any other way because I was going in this one direction and she, I could go back. I can ask. And immediately, I, had been, I just sat there. I was like, that's all her. And then once she said it, she was boom. She was like, shoot. She was like knocking them down. Um, and it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I want to come back to something. So you yeah. mentioned five and two. We haven't actually covered the Ooh, yeah. energy levels here. So how about, how about if we actually detour <laughs> briefly okay. and you, uh, you do the, the yeah. quick overview of, of sort of energy levels and, and yep. I sort of how IPEC frames up how, yeah. how we show up. Yeah. Um, so, so we're both, uh, energy leadership coaches, uh, certified through IPEC, which is the Institute for Professional Excellence in Coaching. Um, it was like a long church name, um, coaching or something, but the energy levels are how we show up in certain situations and level five. And when, when, when the, I talk about level five, as a coach, a coach or a person who holds that level five space is all around opportunity and possibility. Um, and, you know, again, those things that you want to be and hold the space for your client. Um, and then level two, level two and level one are catabolic. And so we talk about catabolic versus anabolic energy. Level one and level two, level one is kind of victim, fight or flight. 
different things in level two is anger. It could be anger, it could be different levels of aggression. Again, although useful in moderation and when going towards a certain thing like adrenaline and different things like that are also in that level one and two, but you wanna operate those higher, those higher levels of energy um, in the anabolic state, which again is serving you, is keeping you positive and all the different things like that. So um, yeah, and I, I love it. Once, once I, once I got into that stuff, that I love it. So thanks, thanks, Laura, for making me break no, that. No, no problem. So, so just, uh, just to recap there. So, so the uh, IPEX flushes out energy levels on a seven, mm -hmm. on a seven scale, on seven scales. Yeah. And so, really, one and two, like Lauren said, they start off with kind of the more, um, far less empowered. I think are probably mm -hmm. the best way to put it. With the catabolic yeah. states. And then level three, you start moving into a little bit more, you know, yeah, yeah, whatever, everybody can, can find a way to make this work and yeah, yeah. whatever, you know, good. Four is a little bit more service oriented. Five mm -hmm. is a little bit more, uh, I, it's what I refer to as the, the excited entrepreneur level <laughs> because it's very like, there's an opportunity and everything. Yeah. You start getting up into six and, and seven and those where you start moving into far more, um, what you might gracefully call enlightened states where you have a lot more mm -hmm. control over, over how you're responding to things and you're not exactly. letting things get, get under your skin. So it is a seven point yeah. scale. Those of us who you know went through IPEC training will sometimes refer to those levels because yeah. sometimes it's, it's a very useful lexicon, I think, to help identify um, something that's usually very nebulous, right? It's, I think mm -hmm. it's often super, without coming up with a language for it, it's sometimes really hard you know, you know, you have a meeting with somebody or you talk to them and, yeah. and you walk away and you think, Jesus, I just want to go take a nap. Holy mackerel. Yeah. Like, they feel like a, this like emotional vampire who just kind of like yep. sucked all the energy out of you. And, and this is a really useful way to kind of identify sure. what you're sure. feeling from someone and how, how you're showing up as well. So, um, great. So, okay. So from a reframing perspective, can you, what is it about reframing that you find like, so, um, so applicable or, or when you see what is it that you look for in a situation that makes you yeah. think ah this is this is actually probably a really useful way yeah. to move forward um i'll use your example that you just used around is it serving or draining um as as a reframe um and when when i think about what serves me the things that serve me give me energy the things that serve me um, are ultimately, and again, they provide me um, a way to stay present. And the things that don't serve me, I get very tunnel vision. I clam up. Um, I get aggressive. I all the things that people say. If I could stop that, that would be it. Like I end up going in all those places. And so when it comes for me to reframe. Is it serving me, supporting what I'm trying to do, the mission, vision, the purpose of why I'm doing something, or is it draining and detracting and taking away from me? Um, and that's that's really it's really that that simple for me, um, and from a foundational standpoint. So, no, that's 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 actually great, and I think that's that's exactly where you know I think it's it it shows up a lot. One of the things that for me, um, once I started understanding the idea of reframing, right, and, and how yeah. coaches use it, things like that, and when I started looking back at my life, I realized that one of the things that I think, and I think this is super fascinating, that is often the most capable of reframing something for someone is art. And mm. I love watching somebody react to, a, or having myself react to a piece of artwork that completely just changes the way you experience something. Wow. And for me, that is, is one of those things that, that the more I've, the more I have, have really up, learned to appreciate mm -hmm. where reframing has been an enormous impact in my life. And to be fair, pretty much every major pivot I've ever made in my life, moving from California to New York, moving from New York to Texas, you know, moving from Texas, leaving the country, coming back, like all of those things were around um, reframing events that happened and in in almost all cases they weren't deliberate i it, so to to mm. your point right what kind of what you're saying i can recognize in the moment when something isn't serving me and maybe i do need to reframe mm -hmm. and i can and i do because i do find it to be extremely valuable um but what i have kind of consistently found is that 
when the universe reframes something for me, it's usually way more powerful. Yeah. Um, and there, it's got this like massive earthquake kind of effect mm -hmm. on my life or the way I view things. And it always reminds me, you know, those optical illusion images where yeah. you look at it one way and you see a vase and the other way exactly. you look at it, you see yeah. two faces. To yeah. me, that's, that is, re that's the best metaphor for reframing. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Because, because one, once, yeah. once you see the other one, you can't not see it anymore. Like you, like exactly. it's so it totally changes it. But nothing about the objective reality has yeah. changed. Yeah. And so I love, and that to me, that has become the hallmark of like amazing art of any kind, right? Performance mm -hmm. art or or, yeah. or visual art. I remember one time I saw. Um, an art, a, an, a piece by an artist and it was hanging in actually it was in the subway in New York and uh, it said uh, I don't remember exactly how it was phrased but basically it said something along the lines of um, my life's amb or my my life's accomplishment or no my life's ambition is not to lose weight and it was a whole it was it was a whole series of work around women dealing with body image issues and things mm -hmm. like that. And it was just this really interesting reframing moment for me because, you know, for a, a lot of, a lot of people, right. That, that struggle is like this eternal battle yeah. and it takes up too much time and too much brain space and too much energy yeah. and too much money and all kinds of things. And we talk the way we talk to ourselves about yeah. it is one of the harshest things we do to ourselves. And, um, and I never really thought about like the quest to manage my weight as being like mm -hmm. my life's ambition. And the moment it was written, like, and, and I saw it like that, I thought to myself, oh my God, yeah, I have actually been expending the amount of time and energy on this one thing that I would do for my life's ambition. And yeah. I'm diverting it to something that doesn't deserve it. Yeah. And so for me, it's, it's a really, and I've, mm. you know, I've had other experiences with art or, or stuff like that, where mm. it's just been like the smack upside the head. Yeah. And so to me, that's been, that's been like the most amazing assortment of surprises sure. that I sure. really, I really love. So can you think of a time when you were yeah. just like surprised kind of out in the wild where something happened and you're like, Whoa, I never thought of that. Yeah. So it, it actually happened. Um, and, I, and as you were talking, it was in the one particularly for health has always been a part of me and my family and um, and how, again, you've reframed it and we've framed it under the guise of losing weight. And I actually had a, a client who he was talking himself through it and he was having this humongous struggle. And not knowing that I was already doing my own thing in my own head. And he just said something. He said, you know what, Lawrence? He said, when I told myself, I need to define what's healthy for me at this age. And he said, and I had an image of what a healthy me looked like. And he said, the moment that he spelled out what a healthy him looked like, it totally changed the game of how he attacked. And so everything he did was around being optimally healthy and all these other like, so he began to eat better. And if, even if he had a cheese, even if he had a cheeseburger, he was like, you know what? I know that I need to walk because I want to maintain my health. And he said before he knew it, he began to slim up and all these other and not knowing he was he was helping me process how i see myself I was like man that's it like at this age and as we get older what does healthy look like in our current state and i think as long as we have a clear picture of what that looks like it's so freeing versus i need to see 170 whatever on the scale i need to be able to fit in this size gene i need to like, no, I need to feel good in my own skin. Like, that, like, that's really what it's all about. And I think him framing it and changing his reality in his head caused something in his body to react to, like you said, that pressure was taken from him to look at a scale and say, this is what health looks like at this weight, mm -hmm. that BMI or whatever it is. He was like, this is healthy for me. Right. This frame 
is healthy. And, and I, I think that is one of the most powerful things and what it can actually do to your mind when you reframe something in a positive way. Well, I think, and what I love about that is, so it's so funny to me because, you know, again, you know, somebody who had weight loss surgery, like this has just been like huge part of my life for a very long time. And so, so every once in a while, I kind of like, it annoys me that I'm still like 16 years after my weight loss surgery, I'm still like devoting as much brain space to it as I still am. And I'm like, oh my God, when is it going to go away? Um, but I think that's what's part of what's interesting is I think some of the concepts that you just touched on, um, I think they work when it comes to weight loss, but they also come work when it comes to other things. I think one of the things that, you know, I, so this last year, I really started uh, trying intermittent fasting after like doing 20 years of low carb, I couldn't take it anymore. And so I wanted to take a different approach. And, and I was going to Latin America where doing low, low carb is crazy. It's never going to happen. Right. I had to come up with a different model that worked. And I discovered that once I reframed at first, I'm thinking, Oh my God, I can only eat it hours a day. This is terrible. What am I going to do? But then I realized like when I started thinking about it, that actually I used to do that all the time. I just didn't think I was doing it. Like, and, and so once I like started doing it, I'm like, you know, this is nowhere near, this is, this is actually the easiest thing I've ever done to manage yeah. my weight. But then the other thing that came into it was, you know, I love Simon Sinek's book, The Infinite Game. Okay. Um, and that was another paradigm shifter for me. And again, it, it's a business book, but I think for me, the biggest thing that it was really useful about was my health and managing that. Because one of the things that he comments on, he goes, look, he goes, you can't go to the gym one day for nine hours and get in shape. Exactly. He's like, but if you go to the gym every day for 20 minutes or whatever, 30 minutes, eventually you're going to get healthy. You just yeah have to stop thinking about the idea that it's got this like finite little switch that you're exactly. going to hit. You just, it just has to be this ongoing yeah. thing. And so for me, that was a really useful reframe for a lot of things, yeah. but it always, so I think that's, it's a funny thing to think about is that how many things I, I look at or I try to reframe mm -hmm. from a business reason or professional yeah. development reason. And really they come back to way more health related stuff. You know, sure. am I, am I working out? Am I exercising? What am I cooking? Like, I mean, mm -hmm. it's just so, and it's interesting to me how frequently it, it all ends up coming back to it, but how the same reframe can, can actually be used in multiple, yeah. in multiple places. And I was thinking, I was, and that's where I was, I was thinking is just that simple idea of how many opportunities am I giving myself to get reps mm -hmm. in a thing. So again, 20 minutes at the gym for your health, an hour of podcasting for your reps, a 20 minutes of video creation to help you. And again, I'm using a new auto cap uh, app for my phone for my videos because because yeah. I read an article that 90% of people read or look at your videos in silence because they're at work or whatever else. So mm -hmm. if you don't have auto captions, they're not looking at your video. And so and, and it's just these different things. And I think, again, this crazy time is, is happening to us all at the same time, but it's also created a very great opportunity for us to get reps in all these other areas to build up a muscle. And I think the, the words that come to mind are discipline and consistency. And I think those are the keys to the city of any successful person is worry, how many reps did you give yourself and how many opportunities did you, did you give yourself to continue to learn how to do things better and in a more excellent way. And again, it goes back to what is serving you and i really truly believe once i really think about what's serving me it comes from a very foundational place of what do i value and why do i value it and i think again when it comes to reframing um once you practice and once you build up the reps and you build up the mental muscle to say you know what how else can i see this and it get it just now for me it just naturally happens to where I find myself apologizing because I reframed and it's just the people like, you know what I did. I'm not sorry for what I said. I'm sorry for how I said it. And this is the intent behind. And again, it's me getting better at communicating. So I'm not a detractor and I'm not pulling from people because I get passionate and emotional and all these other things. But I think this, this time now, Laura, you just, you just hit the nail on the head with, 
this is an opportunity for us to build reps in reframing and building muscle so that we're doing the right things more often than not. Yeah, well, and right now I think it's super easy to fall into not yeah. doing the right things, right? Oh, sure. I mean, and yeah. and so it's I think there's there's extra value in taking advantage of mm -hmm. this time window to try to find. And I think the other thing is too, right? You don't have to do it on a hundred fronts. No, pick pick one or two, pick one or two things. Like yeah. you don't don't you don't need to drink from the fire hose and like try to turn yeah. your whole life upside down, exactly. right? Just, you want to pick a couple of things that really matter, but that are really. It comes back to what I was saying last week about you know it's the little things. What are the yeah. small little things that you can do and yeah. start building in that habit? So sure. okay, as we wrap up here, I want your yeah. best question when you when you are are giving somebody advice on on. Yeah. How do you reframe? When you feel that you are making decisions yeah. that are not serving you or you're in a situation that's not serving you and how you're approaching it, what is the question you ask yourself to be able to uh, start the process of, of reframing? Yeah. Who is being impacted by the way that you're seeing the situation? Okay. Awesome. So hmm. in that case, any last uh, thoughts? So we have connecting the dots on Friday. Yes, we do. So connecting the dots, the power of decisive leadership. And Alora is jumping in on this panel, and she is going to be the third panelist um, on this week. Uh, we had one of the speakers have to pull out, but Alora is doing what she does and serving well and with the other panelists talking about the power of decisive leadership again this is a free workshop um, so go to the event right it is connecting the dots 2020 um, and register for this friday absolutely and you can find the link on my site firebirdsummit.com on the events page so yes decisive leadership which i think is a fascinating fascinating topic in a time when nothing feels certain <laughs> I think if there's ever been a time when it is hard to be decisive, it is right now. So exactly. anyway, I look forward to that on Friday. In the meantime, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful week. You as well. And I will talk to everyone soon. And uh, I hope that you can join us on Friday for Connecting the Dots. All right. Have a good one, everyone.